So a lot of you might wonder what I watch on YouTube, and actually, I'm really busy, and I don't watch too much YouTube, and what I do watch is usually not related to cars, but one guy's channel I do watch a lot is Rob Doms, and, uh, you know, I, he's one of the few guys I actually follow on social media and watch his videos, and he's been doing some really cool stuff lately, and... Um, some of his projects are super sweet, and I thought you guys might want to be interested to see what he's up to lately. So here's your shop, Rob. And, yep. uh, man, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you have, like, about four or five really cool projects yeah. that are, like, would be, one of them would be overwhelming for most groups. Yeah, but it's, it's, keep the blinders on, and that's what's kind of hard. You guys are going to see everything behind us, and that's, when you look at overwhelming, but... Uh, we'll go piece by piece and show you guys all the different things we're doing. So I guess the easy one, because it's right behind us, is the uh, FD, the new one, that uh, you're going to run at Pikes Peak, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, I am very thankful that the Pikes Peak Committee accepted my ap application. Uh, not prematurely, but like I'm green. I'm new to driving, and, and I'm going to take this very seriously. And so, you know, a man is only as good as his machine. And this car has been, I've had this car since 2013, uh, and it's really what started the channel. So it's only right that that car is what goes up there first, as I learn what it takes to drive and build a car now to then take ultimately the four-wheeler. And man, Pikes Peak is like a crazy place. Like, you could be the best driver, you could have the best car, but the mountain decides how well you're going to do. I mean, the weather is so volatile, the conditions are crazy. And, uh, I mean, you're a brave dude. And, uh, I mean, I, I hope you could tolerate, uh, you know, like highs of, like, super achievement and lows of bitter disappointment of things you have no control over. And uh, Well, I, I build rotaries, so <laughs> I do very much accept both of those. <laughs> but, yeah, let's go check out your FD. Yeah. Okay, so this car started its life in my hands as a drag car. Really? It did. Yeah, it was a guy from New Jersey. And, oh, okay. And it made, yeah, it made 750 horsepower. And I love, as soon as you put that pedal down, you know, love. But I wanted more. I wanted better for this. And so I, it's an RX-7. It should turn. And so I've been spending years learning what it takes to turn a vehicle. <laughs> I didn't realize how complicated it was. But something that's inherently trouble, troublesome about a three-rotor in a FD is that the steering rack goes underneath the oil pan. Right. And so it shifts the steering rack down. And so you can make all these different little adjustments and all that, but at the end of the day, bump steer city when you put a three-rotor on an RX-7. Plus the culture of drag racing. It's uh, uh, just get that rack in there, and if the wheels turn when you move the steering wheel, that's good. Good enough. And so I wanted so badly to do three things at once and this is all because of you know this car happening all at once is i wanted the weight to be i wanted to say okay this is a mid-engine car so i wanted the, the engine behind the center line of the wheels mm -hmm. uh which gave me this ability to pick the steering rack up and then also cooling right you know like one of the things i always talk about when people ask me about what does it take to do uh pike's peak the first thing I always say that blows everybody's mind is uh, cooling because the heat exchangers are like probably half the effectiveness near the top and they're probably only about, uh, they're probably 40% less effective at the bottom and these things run hot, right? Very, very. So yeah, so what, you're, what you see is we just got done 3D scanning it and we are about to lop off all of this. and fill every cubic inch of the front with as much perforated aluminum and get as much heat exchanged as possible. And so I even have, uh, grab this. This wouldn't make for a very effective uh, radiator, but nonetheless, it's in the shape of one. And so you can see just how big the main radiator, I'm gonna have three radiators, the main one's going to be. So it necessitates cutting off the frame rails. Oh, yeah, that doesn't even fit in between the frame rails yeah. at all. So I wanted something that, this is like a traditional, as you know, drift car size. So this is a drift car um, meant to be in the back of the car, but putting it in the front, angling it so that way I can get air ducted out of the hood and uh, you know, really have a nice, clean, efficient flow. So 
one of the things that I'm really proud of is, uh, like I said, 3D scanning it, we're gonna have not just oil coolers on each side, but we're in front of the oil coolers are gonna be additional radiators. And then just like my Indy car, I have you know little petcock valves that will adjust how much, So because right now, before I did all this, the oil was overcooled and the radiator was undercooled. Mm -hmm. So I wanna be able to adjust the ratios and uh, cool them appropriately, because oil can, as you know, run way hotter uh, than, than coolant. Uh, especially in rotary. So I'll have three radiators in the front and it'll all kind of tie into like the transmission cooler, the power steering, uh, kind of using them all together in, in one system. And it looks like, uh, I mean, you had to cut your firewall and section it yeah. to move the motor back, but it also looks like you're going to make like a cross member cradle. So it'll be super easy to drop the motor out the bottom. Right. right. Yeah. So with the engine now going into, uh, it'll still have a firewall, but into the existing firewall, we can't pull it out from the top. So the dream is like a race car where it can be safely unbolted from the bottom uh, and then you know serviced from that way. You're going to have sweet Deutsch connectors and quick disconnects, yes. so you'll be able to drop the sucker really, really quickly. Yeah, so I, I, my wiring harness I built for this has an extra, like I want to say, like eight inches of spare length mm -hmm. that I meant I, I designed so I would, at some point would cut and make into a you know a sealed connector uh, for the firewall. How how much power are you planning to make? So uh, I, I guess my return question is at what uh, altitude? <laughs> <laughs> so at, at ground level, at at in Los Angeles, this car makes a thousand thirty three at the rear wheels. Okay. And um, the turbo is one that I I think uh, I don't have experience. So this is completely me being just research. Is that I think it'll be effective um, up in Pikes Peak, low, you know, low uh, density air, high elevations. Um, and I don't, you would know more than me about what power ratio that might be, but um, you know, I, I, I think it'll be a lot of power for up there for, for what I need. Probably be something around 600 horsepower at the top, but that, that's still pretty good. Yeah, that's still great. For... That's the scary part. You're not gonna wanna go fast anyway. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's, that's, that's a good uh, natural limitation for me. Or are you going to use the TurboSmart electronic uh, wastegate to help manage uh, turbo speed? Yes. So this car in particular was the one of the very first cars outside of TurboSmart's own vehicles that ran the electronic wastegate. So uh, early on, I was one of the I was on that bleeding edge, not cutting edge, where the uh, the ECU at the time that software was not controlling the E gate properly, and so um, that's actually one of the reasons I made the thousand horsepower is the E gate. Uh, the, the, the ECU actually bugged out, closed the, the, the electronic wastegate, and I did the dyno pull with a completely closed wastegate, 1,033 to the wheels. Um, but the, the thing that I'm not going to do on this one is use that as a cold side mm -hmm. because that would overspool the, the turbo even more. Because on one of my cars, I'm going to run it where I don't have a wastegate. Uh, turbo Smarts asked me to try it where, you know, it's simply all you know, exhaust goes to the turbo, and then I'm bleeding it off on the cool side. I won't be doing that on this car. Kind of like what the supercharged guys do. Right, right, exactly. But on this one, we'll, we'll still be going with the E-gate because my, my shifting strategy, uh, having an electronic wastegate is like cheating. It's so incredible, but it takes a lot of work to set up. And you can have a table of shaft speed, uh, Shaft speed, so you, it's impossible to wreck your turbo That's up there. That's true. I never even thought about that. One of the things I do is on my hall tech, the flat shifting, you know, because on the four rotor I have a you know strain gauge shifter. There's seven stages of exiting the previous gear between gears, you know, new into the new gear. And so what I'll do is I have the E gate double down at the beginning of the shift, and so it looks like it's it, you. You would think that it's about to overspool, but it's actually not because now you're out of gear, ignition cutting, and so it keeps the boost up and then opens back up again to the mount once you get into the next gear. And so I went from losing, on the four rotor, I went from losing eight pounds of boost per shift to two. Mm. So just a nice, flat, and for power, you know, power uh, uh, placing it to the ground, that smooth. But uh, yeah, so the E-Gate has a lot of ability that people don't realize. And, and I think it's good to actually um, you know, like the factory guys have been doing this for a while, but it's bringing factory level um, boost control to like, uh, you know, like consumers. 
Yeah. And probably where it's going to make the biggest difference is Pikes Peak because, you know, the higher you go, more shaft speed is going to be an issue. And sure. I, sure. I mean, probably if you're going to run Pikes Peak, you better be running one of these. That's true. And so uh, this is the most I've ever gutted this car. Um, you know, engine bay, it's always been like a 52, 53% front weighted car, but uh, now it's actually extremely heavy front because there's nothing in the back. Uh, moving to a full blown fuel cell, uh, meeting all the safety requirements that, that the, the people at Pikes Peak require you to have, full roll cage, and uh, using that to kind of strengthen the, the front because I don't think this car was ever designed to experience the lateral forces that it now does with the addition of aero and just really good wide tires. And we're going to be helping Rob with uh, some suspension geometry and suspension help. And uh, yes. I'm kind of excited to be, well, not kind of, I'm excited to be involved in this project as well. Yeah, so. I couldn't, uh, I, I'm very thankful for that because, you know, I, it's one thing for me to just Google it but it's, that's not getting me where I need to be. <laughs> yeah, you need some uh, idiot savant help now and then. <laughs> yeah, this is, so speaking of that, honestly, is my goal with this build is to have an idiot drive it. That's, that's me, <laughs> right? And so uh, all of the, like, this, is, this goes against my moral fiber, but it, goes, uh, it also is congruent with my wanting to live fiber, which is I have race ABS. I have the Continental RSX ABS system. It's like a video game. We're shift, we're, the shifting is no longer going to be manual, which I love shifting it manually. This is going to air, air uh, sequential shift, you know, air actuated sequential shifter, so paddle shifting. So basically my goal was when I race on the sim, I'm interacting with the car the same way, hands on the wheel, uh, and the car is, is doing a lot of digital nannies, in a sense, in a race sense, uh, to keep me safe. I mean, shoot, you couldn't pay me to drive this up there. As bitching as this is, uh, yeah, I like my life. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, uh, I, I have a, a, a particular enjoyment of my life too. So, so I, like I said, is that I wanted the car to be more compliant. Um, you know, I see some of those guys actually shifting and hands off the wheel, and I'm, and I'm just like, that's not me. I'm not that guy. Yeah, there's a lot to do up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot to do wrong too. So, yeah, so this car, um, the, the thing that broke my heart is that up until this point, this car has always been built for street level racing. So not street racing, but like street class, full interior. Um, and unfortunately, I signed up for Pikes Peak, said I'm using this car, and they said no interior. And so and uh, here you are. Uh, yeah, here I am. So uh, this car weighs or weighed uh, 2,800 pounds without me in it, 3,000 even with me in it. Uh, so I'm curious to see. Uh, we've, de we've definitely removed a lot of weight, not just the interior, not the interior being the, the biggest thing, but shifting the weight backwards, as one of your videos has shown, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, but it, it allows me to have better steering geometry and more room for cooling. I'll take that. Cool. Um, now, the thing that I'm really curious about is the, uh, the 12 rotor that's over yes. there. Let's go look at that. Yeah, so if this is where I, I, I started with, this is where I'm at now. <laughs> I don't even know what to think. This is like one of the craziest things I ever seen. But yeah, this is a 12 rotor rotary. Yes. So this engine, if you look at it from the camera's point of view, from our point of view, it's honestly just overwhelming to look at. Uh, the gentleman who built this is named Tyson Garvin. He's an absolute savant as well. It, it just uh, the man thinks totally different. And so I think this almost maybe started as like a bet, like a bet you can't and somebody bet him wrong. And he built this. Regardless, it was built as a boat motor. And yeah, it looks like a... it, it, it's it, it's extremely heavy. But on boats, oddly enough, I would think that boats where buoyancy is an issue. They, I guess that's not actually that big of an issue. But uh, he asked me, and this is, this is both a blessing and a curse. He asked me to rebuild it. It had been it had been hurt. Um, the, he was using a garden hose basically as as his fuel injector uh, in his carburetor. He was literally using like a. Uh, uh, like a squirt gun or something. So uh, spray. He was oh, using this actually spray. ran before. This ran before, naturally aspirated, and he was using a paint gun uh, with fuel in the, the paint gun into the carburetor to, to run it. Okay. And so it was, it was a, it's a proof of concept motor, uh, and it had a lot of like implications of what it could be potentially for the government, and um, you know, it's a working model. 
But like I said, there was a lot of damage to it, a lot of things that were broken. Did you actually take it apart and get into it? So I, it was delivered to me in pieces. Okay. And so, um, you know, think of a, a, a replacing apex seals on a two rotor, that's six apex seals. Now times that by six, you got 36, you know, apex seals. You've got, uh, you know, six times 12, uh, you got whatever, 72 corner seals. You, know, you got so many parts in, so it's a very expensive engine to rebuild for obvious reasons. But um, I think, uh, this is, I haven't made this formal announcement, but I don't mind sharing it here because it's a technical audience. Um, we're turbocharging it. Okay. So, so what you see here is we're in the middle of Pike's Peak, but this, we're looking at how are we going to put turbochargers on this motor, fuel injection. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite things I've ever done. So uh, what I did was went into CAD and we, we designed a fuel rail a, you know, fuel injection system going straight into the motor, and then we added generative. We added generative design. Well, is that how you got that cool yeah. organic shape? So I told it, hey, expect up to 100 psi. Put tons of force on each of these bolts because they're going to be holding down the fuel rail, and the fuel rail is going to be pulling up. Uh, and then, so you see, the generative design added, basically added like glue to all the, the things that I had, uh, you know, we'd already designed. So uh, Ethan had helped me design this, but then uh, the system webbed it all together. And so this is actually, one of my favorite things is these were built on a three axis CNC machine. You look at it and think, oh, wow, that's... And the iterative design took into consideration the capability of your three axis? Exactly, yeah, I told, I told it, I don't have a, a five axis machine. And so this allows us to kind of Again, this engine is so overwhelming. It allows us to say, let's just focus on fueling. <laughs> uh oh, emergency broadcast. System. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, flash yeah. flood until 645. Yeah. Oh. So, um, th this is just like the, the epitome of like more is more. I, I have some nerd questions. Yes. yes. So, your primary drive, is that a chain? Wildly enough, in this whole back three inch chunk of aluminum, he built a, a, there's four gears inside of there. So it's gear driven. So it's basically think of like my engine. There's a four rotor here. Mm -hmm. There's a four rotor down in this middle area and there's a four rotor here. And so there's three big gears on the back of it. And so they actually rotate. One of them rotates counter. Mm -hmm. And then the other one has a little baby like uh, idler. That, idler gear. And so then it rotates the same. Man, I would be worried about harmonics with the gear drive, and yeah. I would have probably used a Hivo chain or something because I would be more forgiving. Interesting, Interesting. yeah. yeah. The, 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 and I probably would have driven it off of both ends. That's yeah. So what he did is he had three harmonic dampers, uh, you know, the the, the traditional ones uh, on the front of there. So what's really wild about this motor that that it kind of like segues into is that this does not have counterweights. He has it where. And you can actually see it when you look into the motor. Um, uh, even easier with the exhaust off. So I, I, I built these exhaust pieces. You know, all, everything up here is all like ours now. Like the, uh, so what you'll see is on these two rotors, you can actually see that the, they're at the exact same position. Okay. So kind of like a th what some people call a thumper. Yeah. So, so these two fire, and these two fire 180 degrees later. So, they're they're negating the need for uh, counterweights mm -hmm. for the most part. But uh, on like our race four rotors, you know, they're, it, it's every 90 degrees they're they're firing. And so, um, technically, when we fire this up, it's going to be a thumper. It's going to be a, a a two pulse six rotor is the way I, I kind of think of it. So. Six rotors firing, but two rotors at each of those uh, times. So this engine's a very weird engine, but I want to fire it up the way it is now, and then disassemble it and put on counterweights. And we'll okay. Hear Here a 12, 12 rotor, rotor actually seeing. singing. I think what might be interesting too is, um, you know, this is a development proof of concept, but I mean, I'm sure you have everything on CAD, and then you can start optimizing the design. I bet you could shave 50 pounds off the sucker easy yeah. without even trying. Yeah, Tyson was like, I had mentioned that to him too. He goes, that was, that was always the, that next version. Like it was, it was he, he knew he could do it. So it didn't, he didn't focus on that. So you're right, he has it all catted out and everything. And I asked him about that. He said, yeah, if, if, if this one worked and, and whatnot, but this is truly 
his first version of it. You could do iterative design and metal 3D printed and oh yeah, probably sure. take hundreds of pounds yeah. off of this. Yeah, he's got it overbuilt in many ways. Like the, the, the iron plates that are on each side of this are considerably thicker than uh, what you find on normal engines. So, beef. So once you get this thing running, what are you gonna put it in? I, I'm gonna be brutally honest with you. This engine to me, um, I, A, I didn't build it. Um, so I, I don't like, I don't want to take credit for it. I don't want any of that. I just want to be part of the journey of this motor. So for me, seeing this motor like at Mountain, some, somewhere where it's an engine dyno, it's in the air, and it is just making sweet, sweet rotary power, that is my, that's the pinnacle of what I want. Um, Probably break any dyno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that would be a great YouTube video. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that, I don't care what it goes into. Personal, honest, emotional opinion. I don't care what it goes into. I want to see it run. And I, I want to see it in all of its glory. The, beyond that, my question to anybody that asks that is, what would you do with 35 to 45 or more uh, 100 horsepower? Probably make a nuclear drone to blow something up. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Make big money. Yeah. Yeah. Land, land speed. speed. Uh, or land uh, speed uh, might yeah. be a, actually a really good thing to do with it yeah, yeah land speed or uh, you know i think of like the only other vehicle that uses that level of power is a uh pro mod it might be interesting to try to break the wheel driven land speed record you can drive that too <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i was gonna do i was gonna make the this in the four order to land speed when i first started building it i realized that the cage requirements are so insane i was like that's not Maybe I'll build. A, maybe the twelve rotor will be a specific we, chassis. We have interesting land speed stories too, but that could be another day. <laughs> so this is, man, this is more than anybody I know has attempted to bite off. Just about. Yeah, yeah. This one we actually put it under a blanket whenever we're working on anything else because it's 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 like a light for moths. Is that I just like I stare and look at it and I'm like I do this for about an hour, and I'm like. <laughs> I, I still didn't get any further. It's, it requires a lot of thought to work on this motor. Well. <laughs> that is, yeah, and that's funny because that's not even my, like, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, but, like, everything behind here is also equally as emotionally important to me. Of course, you know, my magnum opus, the four rotor, and, you know, that's what, something that you and I are going to be working on more after, after Pike's Peak and whatnot. And then my little baby here What's funny is this is my lowest horsepower car, 700 horsepower to the wheels, but it, it's the highest horsepower per rotor vehicle. So it's actually one of the most rowdy. I mean, 2,300 pound car with 700 horsepower is stupid, absolutely stupid. Uh, but then of course my baby, the Diablo. My That's best probably car. the boring car. <laughs> it's the lowest horsepower car here. <laughs> um, and you know, but that's uh, one of my true loves, childhood, Guinness Book of World Records, 1991 paperback. It's not in the, the hardcover because it only held the record for a little bit of land speed or a production car, fastest production car. Um, then there's the Indy car. That, that thing I should not be allowed to own. I did not know an individual is allowed to own something like that. I, yeah. I have learned, I mean, you can see behind you is, the, is a lot of the four rotor engine parts and the IndyCar engine parts. And so that shelf right there, even though that engine was built in 1997, has taught me so much from being an outsider and going, that's how they do it. That's how like, they optimize that stuff. Well, when you're ready, I know many of the people that helped develop this stuff. So, uh, you know, we, I could finish introducing them to you. And, yeah. uh, you know, like it's been a while, but they could probably answer a lot of this stuff and then you know, help you with any technical questions yeah. too. And I mean, a lot of it's lost knowledge because racing stuff changes so much, right? It, it is, it's, it's I, I feel like I'm, I'm cursed where I just keep going to more and more obscure, less and less people know uh, about it. Like, like you said, it's a handful of people that actually know that. You can't Google that one. But yeah, so I disassembled that engine to learn it and it has taught me so much that now I need to figure out how to reassemble it. Well, my buddy Ken Deagle that I introduced you via text message, he actually used to build these. So yeah, I need his help. Yeah, he could probably help you. And yeah, yeah. so, um, I so mean, he, there's a lot of other cool stuff. Yeah, on so those really pretty uh, billet aluminum plates right there, 
That's actually not my work at all. Uh, it's a company from Australia. That is my current, basically my prototype for the four rotor is like a time attack engine. Mm -hmm. So those are not the drag racing peak power plates. They're high power plates, but they're not, they're thinner. That engine is going to be very light and make, I would say 1500 horsepower without a problem. So as we build the four rotor into like a really crazy time attack, uh, pinnacle vehicle, that's the engine that we'll be using for that car. Does that actually have like an iron uh, friction facing yes. in the billet? Yeah, so uh, let me grab one of those. I've never actually seen one of those apart. Yeah, so they, but you can, oh, that, that's okay. Yeah, so um, it has this little keyway right in here and you, you take this, this thing, and then, you know, it's probably tight right now, but it's got threading on this and inside. And so it'll pull this, uh, I'd say eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit thicker uh, steel insert. Well, and you could pop a freshie in, exactly. wouldn't you? Exactly. So, so that's a different approach than the ones that I've been using and developing. Um, the idea is that, like you said, replaceable faces it is very hard to ignore how beautiful that is. And these guys, I mean, look at their, their machine works incredible. Yeah. So, do they normally just hard anodize that or something for the wear surface, or use like a plasma spray? Yeah. So the, yeah. So the, it ends up being an HBOF uh, tungsten chromium carbide. Uh, there's chromiums, and then there's uh, tungstens, and so I, I, I that's why I rented I rented an X-ray scanner, so I knew what my engine had, and it was it was you know surmet type of uh, surface, but th there's a lot of challenges to running that type of surface. Uh, and then, so this engine right here is actually another four rotor, and this is actually for a friend of mine, Hurt. Uh, oh, Hurt, yeah. yeah. And so he's customer or patient zero, and because he's got such a heavy foot, he is my like challenge to see if I can build a, a cheap four rotor from used parts uh, and handle the abuse of drifting. drifting and. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I know how to handle short bursts of energy. Now I know how to handle longer bursts of you know track driving, but wide open throttle with a person who has no mechanical sympathy. And this would be a good for another video of ours if you can get a grassroots um, obtainable four rotor. Yeah, That'd which be is awesome. still forty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a that's an obtainable four uh, four rotor. Wow, I, did, I had no idea. But yeah, yeah, no, we we actually went and got two, uh, three engines imported from Japan, like two rotors tore them apart and there weren't enough parts to make a solid. Oh, okay. But but yeah, so we're trying to see how many parts you can, you know, these are all used. The rotors are all used. Uh, and then the E-shaft, you can't, you can't weld two two rotors together. And, you know, there's certain limitations. But uh, yeah, this, this will be the, what does it take at the least to build a four rotor? Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah. So... Maybe now we can check out your engineering room. Yeah. The yeah. secret room. It's a mess. Absolute mess, but that means that the stuff's going on. Yeah, so this is where the magic happens. Um, really, this is going to look to people like, oh, my God, they've been doing this this whole time like this. This is literally the, like the first day we've, <laughs> we've got this. So Ethan is really the beginning of our engineering and planning. And this is the three-rotor, the Pikes Peak car. Um, and we're putting all the pieces in there and saying, how are we going to make all these fit? And like I said earlier today, if you can go to the, uh, the scan, we just scanned, uh, this will look just like what they, the people saw. That's exactly what all those little dots were there, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so with the engine in that spot, with the headlights there, we now know, okay, how far forward can we go with the, the uh, radiator before it shoots up the front of the car? So uh, this gives him the, tons of reference points to plan. Uh, so this... It looks like we've been doing this for a long time. This is literally hours. We've finally gotten this. Uh, it's very exciting for us. But uh, this is my dream, is to have like this sort of planning. And that's why I wanted to get this in place when we talk about doing the four-rotor, because I want the four-rotor to exist in the, the three-dimensional computer space before I ever bend a, a weld a single piece. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm used to what, it might sound racist, but we call it Filipino CAD. <laughs> so we just get strings. Uh, plum bobs yeah yeah <laughs> and you know kind of fake it old school but this makes everything so much easier yeah and um 
it's just the amount of analytical tools that are available in the consumer level now nowadays. So even a semi grassroots uh, effort can have like a lot of engineering in there. Yeah, I mean, really, it's been even as of a little, you know, weeks ago, you know, it's been just very ragtag handful of people. Just me, Joel, Ethan's been, you know, really coming up to speed here, and now, you know, it's like it feels it feels cool. It feels like a race team. But it's not. It's just a group of guys that love, love what we're doing, um, and so we're trying to make it the best we can. And really, this is out of sheer absolute necessity. We know what coolers we want. We know what sort of like splitter we want. We know where the wheels are, and now we just have to try and make it all fit. I mean, this is like stuff that F1 teams. It was only available to them not too right, long ago. Right. Yeah. They, I'm thankful for all the teams, or people that have made whatever solid works fusion 360 all the scanner like it's it's neat that it's becoming more and more prevalent but yeah so this is um you know this and then of course as you know infamous editing and can't can't avoid that well what i like is that you know most youtubers are all about the hype and uh mm -hmm. and basically dumb stuff so i can't stand most car youtube channels but i mean yeah. the stuff you do is the real deal and that's why you're one of the few channels I, I actually watch. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, well, you know what it is, is we can film a little bit on this, right? But, but the amount of time he's going to be spending on there, most YouTubers can't justify spending his time or their own time to do this, to make one video, you know, to make a piece of a video. They're, they're looking for that quick, I, I got new wheels, I've got, I've, you know, I got to wrap the car, like quick, you know, payoffs. This is a slow payoff. But I think I, I believe a it, you know my dream is to be able to do these things. So uh, I think that is the payoff for me. Yeah, and, um, I mean most YouTubers just want to blow something up spectacularly, so they build a crappy engine and send it, mm -hmm. or um, yeah. just how it looks and it's all hype. But I mean your stuff's the real deal, and that's why I've always liked what you've done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 crazy because like. We're just finally getting to a point where, okay, these rotary engines are lasting. And I think that's kind of been my progression. It's like I went from like dream of getting them to run. Now they're running. Now they make power. Now they're lasting. And I'm like, shit, I have to drive the car. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been, you know, like I told you about the, the experience with Adam. I've been afraid of them <laughs> for 20-something years. Yeah. But, shoot, now I kind of want to build one. Yeah. So. yeah. And so, you know, I was willing... Um, you know, a little bit about this room is that I was willing to do whatever it took to get to this point. To get the four rotor running was such a personal goal. And, you know, with that fear of not knowing what it takes, uh, I literally rented this shop and lived here for two, three years, um, you know, quietly. It's, it's a commercial space just to make the ends meet. And, and, you know, two in the morning, I'm in my boxers on the CNC machine making, you know, trying weird things, learning. Um, and that's paid off in such a big way, you know, investing in myself. Um, I think it's kind of like if there was a moral to the story, uh, that, that definitely, you know, you know, they say invest in what you know, and I invest in myself. I know, I know myself, and that paid off. Well, I guess uh, we got to look at all of Rob's cool stuff, and, I mean, I'm sure that you would agree that this is amazing. I mean, I thought we did cool stuff, but this is uh, another couple levels more. I mean, you know, I like to play it safe and just follow other people's lead that seem to know what they're doing. But uh, Rob's pioneering, and uh, uh, it's pretty mind blowing that a lot of that happens here yeah. in this pretty small shop. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, if you enjoy this content, uh, be sure and subscribe. Uh, visit our e store, buy our merch, help me out, and. Uh, you know, we're going to be following Rob and helping him out as he uh, goes on his journey to Pikes Peak and kick butt and time attacks. So look for more content uh, with Rob and what we're doing and all that. So until next time, we'll see you later.